You're listening to Make It Big, a podcast about all things e-commerce, created by Big Commerce. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Make It Big podcast. I'm Lauren Riazzi, Senior Marketing Performance Manager here at Big Commerce, and I'm so excited to be here with Ryan Dice, founder of Digital Marketer. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. You have a ton of experience across marketing, launching and scaling businesses and investing. Can you walk us back to how it all started from launching your first website in your freshman college dorm room at the University of Texas in 1999, go Longhorns, to becoming a renowned industry leader? Well, so it's a long story because I'm old, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Yeah, I was really fortunate to be born when I was, you know, to think about kind of graduating from high school and entering college in 1999. That was really at the peak of the first, you know, dot com bubble. I went to a, you know, a college that had high speed Internet and I just made the decision when I got on campus. You know, everybody's telling stories about Dell Computer and Michael Dell and how he started, you know, his company uh, from Jester Dorm, which is literally across the street from where from my dorm. I was like, I'm going to do this. Like, I want to start my own. You know, we didn't call them startups. We called them dot coms back then. Well, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but uh, I was able to get a job at this email marketing company. And and this was back in the day before like can spam or any of this stuff. And literally their, their entire business model was they harvested email addresses and they would basically spam people. Uh, now, they were quote unquote legit because they would unsubscribe folks. It was a different world back then. And I was so excited. I was like, this is going to be my big break. Well, unfortunately, that company wound up uh, going out of business. They had raised some money. Things didn't work out. Some of their bigger clients fell as the as the dot com bubble burst. And I was out of a job. And but what I did know how to do, I figured out how to design really, really, really simple landing pages because their whole model was let's get people to sign up for major publishers email newsletters. We call them e-zines back then. So that was my very first start. And so you know, I, I was like, well, what can I do? Maybe I can design web pages. So I started like designing web pages. And my very first and only client was actually a lactation consultant. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is great. I've got four kids now and my wife uh, nursed all of them. But at the time at 19, building a website for a lactation consultant was very awkward. Uh, my friends didn't quite understand why I had like pictures of breast pumps and all kinds of stuff on my on my screen. Um Again, fast forward, make a long story short, economy kept cratering. Her husband wound up losing uh, his job. She had to go back to work and she couldn't pay me to build the website. But what she did, I have so much respect for this woman. She taught me so much. Um, she realized that, you know, once I teach women how to nurse, once I teach moms how to nurse, and once their kids wean, like they don't need me anymore. Uh, so I want to get into early childhood nutrition. So she, she had this ebook created that was all about how to make your own baby food. And she felt so bad that she couldn't pay me for this website that she said, look, I, I want you just to have this ebook on how to make your own baby food. It was just a simple, like 20 something page PDF. And um, I was like, thank you. What the heck am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> but I did a little bit of uh, Google searching. Uh, well, actually, it wasn't Google. That was kind of a little bit pre-Google. I think it was on Alta Vista or something. I did a little research and I was like, there's actually a lot of people looking for this. And so I built a simple one page website. I... You know, I think I, I set up an early PayPal account and uh, set up a, a page and was able to get it, you know, optimized and listed in the search engines. And a few days later, I made my very first sale of this little ebook on how to make your own baby food. And uh, I said, what if I had like 20 of these? What would happen? And that was my whole model. That was where it kind of all began. Um, essentially, let's create a, a simple little kind of niche publishing company. It's not what I thought about it at the time, but that was where it began. Literally, a uh, you know, a lactation consultant who couldn't pay me was the reason that I launched my uh, very first uh, product online. That's super interesting. I would not have pegged that as the beginning, but awesome story. Okay. So in order to understand how to scale businesses, I want to start by diving into the core foundational aspects of entrepreneurship. In your opinion, what are the top three things business leaders need to focus on to build a successful business? Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of just, I would say, table stakes. I mean, obvious things that that you need to do in terms of, you know, helping to set the company, you know, vision and all all that. Like that's that's there. I I think the most important thing that I've had to wrap my head around is shifting from focusing on creating all the strategy to really picking like what is our company's North Star? 
Like, what is the one big thing that we're going to focus on? And for us, we do it quarterly, right? And, and we may roll over the same, you know, quote unquote, North Star from quarter to quarter. But the selection of that, you know, being able to say, okay, we are going to focus this quarter on this one particular metric. How do we align everybody around this one metric? Like, that is the thing that is the difference between growth and scale. You know, growth is like picking the right projects to do. Um, and that's going to get you to a certain point. But if you really want to go from growth to scale, it's less about, you know, doing stuff and even picking the right projects and more about picking the right metrics that you want to move and getting everybody aligned to that so that they're, you know, your team is picking the project. So I'd say that's the biggie. Uh, the other thing, it's it said a lot, uh, but just recruiting and having great people. I mean, that is the thing that has made the biggest difference. We have found time and time and time again, if we weren't growing, it's because we had, you know, maybe somebody that was really great, somebody that we really liked, but the, you know, kind of the right person in the wrong seat. Um, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do was let somebody go who was a really good person, who was trying really hard. Um, I had to fire a guy who was in my wedding for crying out loud, like that sucks. But you got it. You realize that at scale, like it's about more than just you and the friendships and being popular and and um, and being liked. Uh, and and so that's a biggie. I, I would also say, um, just getting really good at asking questions early on. You you're the one with all the answers, especially if you're getting started. It's just you. Um, and what I found is, if my team asks me a question, I'm going to give them an answer. Right. Even when I don't know what the heck I'm talking about. Right. I'm going to give them an answer and they're going to go and do it. Uh, even when I'm like, maybe you could try this. It's like, OK, that's a mandate and we need to go and do it. Not how I intend it to be. But what I found is as we've scaled and as we've grown from like a smaller company to a slightly larger company, um, our rate of growth has everything to do with defining that, you know, that that North Star, getting everybody aligned to that, making sure we got great people and then just asking questions to help guide the teams to the right answer as opposed to just giving them all the answers. Yeah. No, I love what you said about um, aligning to the same goal, the same purpose, and just cascading in that down to all your departments. I feel like that's super important. Um, and yeah, getting the right people on the bus, making sure that they can be smarter than you and fill your gaps. So that's awesome. Well, and that's what you said there is big, by the way. Um, and, and I say this to everybody who is a leader in this company, you will grow you, your ability to get promoted is directly, you know, related, directly proportionate to your ability to hire people smarter than you. And it's counterintuitive. And as a team, as a leader, you have to model it. And um, and it's tough, right? Especially if you're an entrepreneur, because you're good at everything. And a lot of entrepreneurs are like, oh, I need to find somebody who's like me. Well, the people like you are starting their own companies, right? So what you need to find is somebody who's really, really good at something that that in the beginning you know, we start by hiring for our weaknesses. But again, the difference between growth and scale is hiring for strengths. And, and that very first hire that you make, like whatever the thing is that you most value, if you're like, like for me, I'm good at marketing. It is a thing that I value. Um, the very first time we hired somebody to do marketing, I'm going I'm like, you know what? This person's, I think, maybe better at marketing than I am. I don't want to admit it, but it's like, they're pretty dang good. That was when we up-leveled. And so just getting clear on like, this is what I'm good at. And people will say, never give up that thing you're good at. Uh-uh. You're going to have to, you're going to have to give that up. Yeah. And if you have that North Star, it all aligns. All right. So you talked to us about how you started your first website and you're a great story leading up to it. What were your struggles? What were the big things that you had, big hurdles that you had to overcome? Yeah. I mean, there were a lot. Like, so I, um, I, I, I made my first sale online from that, you know, silly little ebook on how to make your own baby food in 1999. That expanded by the time I, I graduated. I had over a hundred little websites selling a lot of little products. Um, some of them physical products, e-commerce. Most of them were digital products, and um, and it was working okay. But it was so, there was so much stuff that I didn't really know what was working and what wasn't. And I remember uh, waking up one morning, and the first thing I would do every morning. I'm sure you know anybody who's listening to this right now. I I, I bet the first thing that you do as well is you go in and you check your stats. You check your sales. How much money did I make? Absolutely. Right? It's the best. And you like click refresh and it's like, yeah, there's more. It's the best. Well, I checked my stats and, and for the first time I was like, wow, this is really bad. Like, where did the sales go? And I waited all day and I was like, there's no more sales. And the next thing went by, I was like, there's no more sales. What happened? 
Uh, well, I did a little bit of research and I realized that Google had just done their first major algorithm update. It was a Florida update because um, I guess it happened while there was a Google conference in Florida or something like that. And oh, literally overnight, all of my websites were just gone. Right. And, and, you know, if I'm being completely transparent, I was doing a lot of very aggressive SEO type stuff back then. Right. And so overnight, just poof, gone. Well, I was like, OK, I'm not I'm going to figure this thing out. You know, I'm, and I'm and I'm done with with search. I'm going to I'm going to shift everything over to paid. I want, I want something that I can depend on. And so I took a couple of years trying to figure out the paid side of things. And I eventually did crack the code, but I, I really wasn't watching my finances at all. I didn't, you know, again, I'm more sales and marketing. I was like, ah, if there's enough gross, there'll be some net around here somewhere. And um, I looked up one day and I realized that I was a quarter million dollars in debt. Um, and I didn't have the money uh, to pay it. And so that was the first real kind of scary, terrifying, um, you know, I would say failure. I mean, I, I had to, I had to scramble. I, I didn't file bankruptcy. I thought I, I thought I would have to, to be honest with you. But I, I took all my different websites. I cut it down to the 80-20 that were actually moving the needle, streamlined, cut back a lot of the budget, frankly, cut back a lot of my personal spending. Um, had to confess to my wife that, you know, we were a quarter million dollars in debt. Uh, that was not fun. <laughs> um, and it took about a year to crawl out of that hole. Mm -hmm. But when I crawled out of that hole, one of the things that I hadn't done during that season was pay taxes. All the money was going in to pay back the debt. And so I had a pretty good year. I didn't personally make a lot of money. Again, it was all just going back to paying off like credit card debt, lines of credit and all this other stuff. And I remember getting a phone call from my accountant um, and I was feeling pretty good. I was like, yeah, it's going to be a, you know, it's a new year, fresh start. You know, I'm back at zero. I'm merely broke. Um, I'm not in, in massive debt. This is going to be good. And I got a phone call from my accountant and it turned out I now owed about a quarter million dollars to the IRS. Same thing. And again, same deal. I didn't have it. And, um, I'll tell you, I learned then the value of email lists, right? I mean, the, the big lesson that, that I did there, because I was able to actually get out of that hole in a couple of weeks. And what I did is I went back over the course of the previous year and I said, what were the best offers that we did across all of our different businesses? And I simply went back, pulled them off the shelf, queued them up, and I just did a massive sale, big offer blitz across every different business that we had and generated about 330, you know, 350 something thousand dollars, I sent every penny of that sale to the IRS to both pay him for what I owed him and pay him for what I would own based on the money I made to pay him back. Yeah. Wow. Um, those were big. Those were massive failures. I mean, along the way, and they, they cost me so much time. And so, I mean, you know, the people listening can't see me. You can't. I've got a lot of gray hair and a lot of them happen. Uh, you know, a lot of them happen that year. Uh, I, I made a really bad hire. I fired myself as a CEO, made somebody. You know, ask somebody to come in and run the company. Uh, I didn't watch them closely enough. I abdicated total responsibility to them. And I lost a lot of great people and almost lost the company. Um, so yeah, there's been a lot of ups, but uh, but there's definitely been a lot of downs. The the thing that has saved me is just being able to to create offers, like being able to just go and just do some marketing, do some selling when you have to, you know, when you have to do it. And knowing my customers, right? And knowing what they wanted. Um, that's helped. But yeah. There's definitely been some ups and downs along the way. Yeah, I would say also knowing yourself, like you um, replaced yourself as CEO in order to keep the business moving. And that's a huge thing that you were able to recognize you weren't the right person and someone else needed to step up. Yeah, I, I do believe that the decision to make the hire was the right one. I think the mistake that I made was on the execution side in that I just basically handed the entire company over to this person. Um, and I just was like, I'm going to go somewhere else. Like I was burnt out. And you just can't do that. When you're running a company, that's your company. You know, you, you got to you gotta stick it out. So if you want to hire somebody and get some help, that's great. That's very often the right decision. But understand the difference between delegation and abdication. Uh, what I did was outright like abdication. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, again, it, it, it's, it's been good. Like we've been able to, to learn a lot. And, and what you said before in terms of knowing yourself is dead on. What I now know is I'm pretty resilient. And I think that's the thing that trials teach you. When you get through them, you're like, I can take a lot. And, and so it, it now takes quite a bit to, to kind of scare me. Okay. So we talked about your early days and how you almost gave up. You were thinking about bankruptcy and all of that. 
What is the advice that you'd give today's business leaders who may be in the same boat? How can they quickly shift, implement new ideas and strategies? Yeah, I mean, I think it's about learning from the past without lingering there too long. So an, uh, uh, just a, a ritual that I have, and I've, I've taught it to my team and you know, people who are in like our different mastermind programs and things like that, we teach it to them as well, uh, but we call it the 90 day look back. And so every quarter I go back and I make a list of what are, what are the things I'm most proud of? And, and funny enough, it, 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 it can be hard to remember. Um, and even when I had wins, cause I tend to, when there's a win, it's like great check, move on. Um, I really remember the failures, right? We, I'm more apt to celebrate a failure than a, than a win. And I think that is a flaw, by the way, I don't, I don't rec- you know, recommend that, but, um, but I'll go back and I'll look at my calendar. Like, what did I do? You know, over the last 90 days, it's very therapeutic. And, and when you go, you're like, that was good. That was a win. So I make a list of all my wins and then I make a list of all of my regrets. I know there's plenty of people who they say, oh, no, you know, no regrets. Like, and I, I get the sentiment, but I do think that it's important that you just take a moment to say, no, 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 that sucked. Or no, 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 that was a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. Because if you just kind of spin or Pollyanna every little thing that went wrong, you don't learn from it. So I go back and I say, what were things that worked? Make a list of those and say, how do we repeat these? This is now a learning. It's potentially an asset. And it could be everything from, you know, we made this really great hire. Okay, let me reverse it. It went well. What did we do that, that made that happen? Or we ran this promotion. It was really, really successful. Okay, let's reschedule that for later in the quarter. I can't tell you how many times we've done ultra successful launches and promotions and then never did them again because we simply forgot. Right. Like that was the big lesson when I dug myself out of that hole was just taking all the old wins off the shelf. So, so you need to do that, but then also the regrets and saying, okay, what can we learn from this? Lessons come from the extremes, extreme wins, extreme losses. So I think a lot of being nimble comes from having ideas that you could pull off the shelf comes from, because when you're there and you're in crisis mode and you're freaking out or um, maybe things are going really great. It, uh, that's when we're not always at our most creative. But if we've got a list of things, we go, okay, these are some wins that we've had that we can pull off, these are some loss that we have that we know not to do. It really narrows your focus. So I, I think so much of, of quickly shifting and pivoting, it's less about being creative and it's more about just having a lot of good ideas and really, really bad, let's never do that again idea, um, the repository that you can pull from. No, I really like that. It's, it's You always do project retrospectives, QBRs, look at the actual performance of your um, your initiatives. But looking back at the other, the less tangible, the more like your personnel, how is that working? The hiring process, how is that working? Getting more behind the scenes, I think, is a really interesting perspective. You've challenged a lot of businesses to ask the question, how will you go about acquiring customers profitably and predictably? This ties back to customer value optimization, a term that you actually coined earlier in your career. Walk us through what customer value optimization is and why it's so important for businesses of all shapes and sizes to focus on. Yeah, customer value optimization kind of flips the script on conversion rate optimization. So when I was coming up in in marketing and digital marketing in particular, everybody was focused on optimizing their conversion rates. And, And what I found is that there's really a lot of diminishing returns there. I mean, we would run a ton of split tests and the vast, the kind of the dirty secret about split testing is most of them don't move the needle at all. They, they just don't. Um, and, you know, we would try a lot of stuff and, and there's interesting stories like, ooh, we changed the color of this, you know, buy box from blue to green and increased conversion rates 18%. It's like, okay, but what was the actual net effect of that? So after jumping through these hoops and doing all this stuff and finding I'm not making any more money, uh, I was like, What's more important than this? And, and what we realized is that the most important thing that we could focus on and, and really kind of piggybacks off of what I was talking about in the outset about what's your North Star, our very first North Star that when we solidified it was let's increase our average customer value, right? What is our average customer value? Let, let's figure it out. And that's that's easy enough to to figure out. You take how much revenue you generated over the over a certain period, you divide it by the number of customers you acquired, boom, you got it, right? And, and maybe you might do like a 90-day customer value or something. But what I said is like, if we can focus on this, forget conversion rate optimization. If we can increase the value of each and every customer that we have, then not only are we going to generate more revenue, but what we can now do is we can actually scale our growth 
without having to sacrifice overall margins, right? So it's in simple terms, if you double your average customer value, which I'm not saying is easy, but if you were able to double your average customer value, you could theoretically spend twice as much to acquire a customer at the same net margin, right? And I've, I've always believed that he or she who's able and willing to spend the most to acquire a customer wins. Um, and as a bootstrap business, like I can't just go and spend, you know, I don't have a giant pot of money to go and spend. It was going to have to come from, come from my customers. So we just, we changed it. We said, let's have all the focus be on increasing average customer value. And there's only so many ways you can do it. You can raise your prices, which a lot of people, they don't realize how much elasticity they have in their prices. I've, I've yet to really see a case where you raise your prices 10 to 15% and it drops conversion rates much at all. It is rare that we would double the price and it would cut conversion rates in half, right? It, it's rare. And, and no, look, you can't do this in all markets. If you're in kind of a more commoditized space, you can't do it. But there's more opportunities to raise prices than people realize. We've even done it before where we kept the price the same, but went from one payment to two payments, right? Same price today, but just added some extra payments. That's a way to double the price without, you know, doubling what's there. Um, also bundling, adding upsells, saying, and, and this has done a lot in e-commerce, but not as much as it should be. I was working with a guy who um, he had an NFL licensed uh, store. Like, so he sold, sold NFL, National Football League licensed merchandise. And his margins were razor thin because the NFL and the teams were getting all this money. But what we realized is if somebody's really into the Cleveland Browns, let's just say, um, and, you know, they're going to buy all the licensed merchandise, but he could hire a photographer in Cleveland to go and take some really cool photographs of the stadium and to go and take some awesome aerials and things like that for almost nothing. And now he owns that photograph and now he could bundle with kind of the NFL license merchandise, you know, a photograph of the stadium that he doesn't have to pay a license on. So ideas like that to increase it, that was really what made the difference. Uh, just getting people to stick around longer, you know, reducing your refunds and your returns, like all of these things. I just, I truly believe that most businesses, if you're looking for what should my North Star metric be, don't make it on increasing conversion rates or even, um, you know, reducing kind of your, your average cost per click or your, you know, what does it cost to acquire a customer? Focus first on how do we maximize our average customer value. And that really is what customer value optimization is all about. You also have a really great infographic or flowchart on your blog, uh, Customer Value Optimization, How to Build an Unstoppable Business on digitalmarketer.com. I found that super helpful. I'm a visual learner. And so it was really easy to walk through and exactly what you just explained, see how that can be the most helpful option for you. Yeah, I'll tell you a really quick story. I know what you see there on the site, that is a prettied up version of what I actually scribbled on a napkin. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, so the first time when I realized I was in all of this debt um, and I'm sitting at a bar at the Hilton Anatole in Dallas, Texas, and I'm wondering like, OK, I'm a quarter million dollars in debt. Nothing is really working. You know, what do I do? Um, I kind of did my first little retrospective and I said, what is working? And I realized that I had this very simple process of the funnels and the offers that I was doing that worked followed the same flow that I described there. And I just scribbled it on a, on a napkin and I said, okay, this is the only thing that I'm going to do. Every business I have that doesn't conform to this, I'm going to go ahead and back burner it. This is the only thing that I'm going to do. And that was, you know, how we were able to kind of turn things around. So that, that, that little flow chart there is actually very meaningful to me. That's awesome. You're like the JK Rowling of business. <laughs> you just write it all on a napkin and then... <laughs> I, I will accept the compliment. Boy, howdy. Yeah, she's uh, she's had a bit more success uh, and a bit more impact on the world than I have. All right. Let's shift gears now to focus on the next stage of growth. The businesses who are growing rapidly or have hit a ceiling with their current tech stack. You've scaled seven to nine figure businesses in entities, including digitalmarketer.com, rivalbrands.com and platter.com. What's the secret? I mean, I think the secret could be summed up really with one phrase, which is it's about who, not how. And I know for me, I'm a learner. Like I like to dig in and get my hands dirty and I like to figure stuff out. Uh, it is what frankly made it possible for me to go from zero to one, right? I think most kind of natural entrepreneurs, the, like if you're an innovator and a driver, right? You're gonna, you're gonna figure it out and you have to because it's only you. And I think the secret of scaling from, you know, seven to nine figures is realizing that 
That thing that made you great at that first stage is the thing that will be your likely downfall at scale. That's going to be the thing that um, that's going to be the thing that holds you back. I mean, you know, they talk about how the, you know, the, the opposite side of the coin of genius is madness. Uh, I truly believe that anybody, anybody who is extraordinary in any way, that thing that makes you extraordinary is going to have a dark side that that can and will bring you down. And I know for me, um, it's trying to figure stuff out. Uh, you know, especially, you know, talked about tech stack stuff. I was I would go and sign up for things and I'd figure it out. I'd teach myself web design. I'd teach myself how to figure all that. That was what I did. And I prided myself in my ability to jump in and figure it out myself. And as we were scaling, I became the bottleneck. I frankly started making, uh, you know, choices on different solutions that we're using because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. When I just got on my own way and was like, you know what? I, this isn't me anymore. It's no longer what I do. I need to find the person who's better at this than I am. I need to find the who as opposed to trying to figure out how. And in doing that, um, it it just, it worked. That that is what made all the difference. But I'll tell you, it's still tough. I revert back into my my old habits all the time. Uh, My team, and I've given permission to my team and my leaders. You know, you had uh, Richard Lindner on this podcast. Um, One of Richard's like unadvertised duties is to call me on my crap when I am doing something that I should not do. I love that. So yeah, what's the secret to kind of scaling from seven to nine? It's just realizing the thing that made you great. You got to you gotta die to it. You got to die to it. And it sucks because if that's where your identity is, it, it can be really tough. Yeah, setting aside the ego. Yeah. Um, okay, so businesses can't scale overnight. It's really important to be more intention focused versus trying to grow as fast as possible. What's the key strategy to setting ambitious but realistic business goals? Uh, first it, it's got, and again, this sounds cliche. I'm going to say it anyway, though, because I was so awful at it. And that's, you need to make decisions based on data. And and the reason that I say, I say this for all the entrepreneurs out there who are like me, who you have good instincts and your instincts have taken you very, very, very far. And so you're less inclined to look at the actual data because you know why something isn't working. Right. And I'm kind of throwing up the air quotes there like, you. oh, I know why that's not working or, oh, I know what will work. Or, oh, I know what we should do because I'm so experienced and I've been doing this for so long. I cannot tell you how often I've been wrong. And it's like the greater degree of certainty that I have, the more just absolute it is that I'm probably wrong. And I don't know why that is. I really <laughs> don't. I don't like that that's the case, but it's amazing. And yet the data is all there to be had. All of this data is there to be had that, you know, technology solutions are great right now in the data that they give you. Uh, So I think number one, if you're going to make goals, your goals need to be based on data, not just like guessing on what on what is. Everybody has to agree on what is is we've we've set goals for, you know, um, for like a revenue target or, you know, monthly recurring revenue. And we didn't even realize that, you know, we were starting from the wrong place. Like our, 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 our revenue number wasn't even what we thought it was in that category. A number as simple as that. We didn't even know our starting point. So it's got to be based. Um, it's got to be based on data. In the beginning, I think you're fine to set a goal and, and just guess, but you got to know that that's merely a hypothesis, right? You're not actually goal setting. You're kind of following the scientific method and hypothesizing, right? So if you're going to say it's a goal set, then you got to know where are we today? Where are we moving uh, towards? And that, that should be based on real data. Also, I'm a huge fan of, of quarterly goal setting and setting quarterly targets. I really hate annual goals. I think annual is like the worst. I think it's the worst possible goal setting timeline ever. It is the spork of goal setting. It is, it is in between. Um, it's not far enough out to do something really meaningful that gets people excited, but it's not close enough to actually be predictable. I mean, God, how all these companies that set all these goals at the end of the year in 2019, they're like, this is what 2020 is going to be. That's freaking adorable. Right. <laughs> right. We don't, we don't, 2020 had a different idea. We don't do that. We do quarterly goal setting. Um, I think most companies until they're getting well into, you know, nine figures uh, probably should do quarterly instead of annual. You got a floor full of analysts at a building and they can, you know, you're starting to think out like 10 years, then, then sure, go to annual. I think way more small businesses should be focused on quarterly goal setting. And then the the next thing is you got to review progress towards those goals weekly. So we talked about it being based on data. 
You got to have the scorecards. You need to look at it weekly because um, if you just wait and, you know, people do this with annual planning. OK, we're going to set our, our goals. They get to the end of the year and they go, how do we do? Right. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. But businesses do it all the time. Um, if, if you do quarterly goal setting and you check in weekly, you got 12 different places where you can vector, right, where you can make adjustments, where you can do little pivots. And um, it's sort of like a, you know, a plane flying across the country. They don't just go in a straight line. They're, they're vectoring around a little bit off target. Um, so those are kind of, when it comes to goal setting, the, those three things are big. Yeah. No graph is straight up and to the right. There's always those little dips that you may or may not have planned for. So looking at, yeah, you need to look at the big picture, but you got to have those small moments to know you're on the right track. So quarterly makes total sense. The reality is that most people can learn how to grow and scale a business if they want to, but it's kneeling down the operations that make all the difference. What's the best way you've found to achieve operational excellence? So I'll just say at the outset, I am not uh, a world-class operator. Again, I'm more of a sales and marketing person. I've got a lot of respect for people who um, they walk into an organization. And I think about like, you know, you remember that, that movie, uh, Beautiful Mind? where like they're seeing all the flows and stuff like I think there's people that literally they walk into a building and they can do that. Um, I can't naturally. So what I've had to do to get better at operations, because it is a skill that I've had to develop, is um, I've gotten good at mapping value flows. And it goes back to just looking at customer journeys and things like that. But we start with the question of where is value actually created in this business, right? In any business, they do a lot of things, but there's only so many things that are that are a critical component of the value creation process, right? So a digital marketer, um, we we do a lot of stuff, but we produce a new workshop every uh, every month, right? We do a new workshop every month. That workshop is consumed by our monthly paying by our, by our paid monthly members, right? So it's a deliverable. It is also you know splintered off and it might be sold a la carte to attract new members. Um, it is broken up and, you know, derivative work is created for other, you know, products and deliverables for social content, things like that. Like it, it, when we find, when we ask that question, we're like, wow, the, 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 the creation, the fulfillment of this monthly workshop is where a massive chunk of value is created at digital marketer. That was a breakthrough for us. And so I think every business needs to answer that question. Where is value created? Um, and I, we found value flows. There, there's kind of three primary ones. Um, there's like a growth engine. So value is created by the acquisition of new customers. Value is created by the innovation of new prod products and value is, is created by the fulfillment of those products, right? And some, some companies are going to be more kind of growth oriented. Some are going to be more, you know, innovation driven. You can think about like an Apple or something like that. Um, some companies are gonna be more fulfillment driven, like an Amazon. So I think knowing, again, between those three, where does the value truly rest? What is that? And then map that flow. And what we do, again, this is super simple. So like I'm not Six Sigma black belts or anything like that, right? I'm just like a redneck. And so what we do is we say, okay, this is where value is created in our company. Where does it start and where does it generally end? So you got to get a sense of the scope. So for us, like let's go back to the monthly workshop that we create at Digital Marketer. You know, where does it stop? Start. Okay. Somebody's got to come up with a list of what workshop should we put on? You know, let's figure out whose job that is, right? Well, that's important. Like the leadership team, you know, the, the head of like product and, you know, growth, and they're all going to get together and they're going to say, these are the workshops that we need to do for the next two quarters. And that list is created. Okay. The creation of this list, that is the starting point. Uh, where does it end? You know, well, it ends when it has been uploaded to the membership site and it's fully distributed and productized. Okay, great. You've got your beginning, you've got your end. Then what you do, like what I'll do as the facilitator, and again, this is about asking the right questions. I talked about this before. You go back to the start and you say, okay, we got to come up with this list here of workshop ideas. We all agree that this is where it starts and this is where it ends. Everybody agree? Yep. Great. Okay. Two thumbs up. If this is where it starts, what happens next? What happens next? What do we do next? And I'll have all the people who are involved, all the stakeholders will say, well, I think it's this. Somebody else is like, no, this happens first. This happens before that. Okay. And I've got post-it notes and I literally would just write down what somebody says on a post-it note and I'll just stick it next to it. Say, okay. And then what? Write the next step. Once everybody agrees, stick it to the whiteboard next to it. And then what? And then what? And then what? And I am then what? Remember I said leadership is a lot about asking the right questions. It doesn't mean it has to be a complicated question. 
just sitting there with a dumb look on your face saying, then what? Uh, having people talk about it, that is often good enough. Uh, and so we'll map this entire value flow, right, from beginning to end. And the next thing we say is, okay, within all these different stages, what are the ones that really matter? The ones that if we don't get this right, nothing else is going to matter. And that would be the stage that we would actually create a true process around. Let's create a step-by-step -step checklist to make sure we don't screw this thing up. I think when it comes to building business process and documentation, everybody starts with like, I'm just going to document this thing that I do. And everybody goes and they create a bunch of documents and they create a bunch of process and nobody ever uses them. They get put in a binder on a shelf somewhere and it's like, well, that was a total freaking waste of time, right? Where does value start? Where is value created? Map that flow. Figure out the stages within that process that really move the needle. Document that. Train to it. Hold people accountable to it. Have somebody uniquely responsible for it. If you do that, everything else is a way of working out. You can, you can let your other process documentation happen over time. But I found that's the simplest way to do it. And I found in most companies, there's really only, you know, half a dozen, maybe at most, value flows. And within each value flow, there's maybe only another half dozen processes that really matter and really need to be documented. I think in most of these companies, you're talking about 20, 20 things that need to be documented at some point. It just doesn't have to be that hard. Yeah. I actually really like that process that you've laid out. And I think I might have a workshop here at Big Commerce following the same process. It, it sounds like a great idea and can really increase some collaboration too, which always is a good thing. All right. So of course, we can't have you here and not talk about all the ways you can leverage your marketing channels to promote healthy business growth. Based on what you're seeing in the market right now, what would you recommend businesses focus on? Well, I'll tell you that I think we're about to see a shakeup like we haven't really seen in a while. Um, and that is with kind of we're, we're increasingly moving into a cookie-less world. Oh, yes. Um, I, I think a lot of uh, digital marketers in particular um, they don't know what marketing is without having cookies and tracking pixels and all this other stuff to use at their disposal to do retargeting and, you know, hyper targeting and all this stuff. A lot of that, not all of it, companies are still going to figure out a way to do it, but a lot of it is going to go away or be rendered less effective, which, mean, which means if you were on the edge of like, well, these campaigns are doing OK, they're a little bit profitable, maybe they'll lose some money, but they're doing OK, those will be done. Um, again, I think it's all going to be fine because the way that it shakes out is, you know, if there's less people in the, the folks that are at the top, it, you're just going to have more consolidation for better or worse. I mean, if, you know, the rich, are get, the rich will get richer. So if you're rich, yay. If you're not, you better get rich fast. Um, so I think in an increasingly cookie-less world, the things that are going to matter, first and foremost, is messaging, copywriting, right? Copywriting. Like that is... Everybody forgets about it, but I remember marketing pre-cookie. I remember marketing before Google, before Facebook and Google had any kind of retargeting, but before you could do custom audience, before you could do any of this stuff, right? And the way you want is you had to figure out where is our audience hanging out? Where are they? Right? Oftentimes people they 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 talk about your market and and they think about your market as as a person, as a who. The market is not a who. The market is a place. Where are they? Right? That's what you got to figure out. And then it's, okay, how can I put a message in front of them that when they see it, they will take action, take, you know, they will, they will notice and take some action based on what I said. Right? That's what marketing used to be. And, and, and advertising and buying traffic, that's simply the amplification of what? The amplification of a message. I think marketers have been able to get super lazy with their messaging They've been writing kind of crappy boiled chicken copy because they were able to so carefully target. I think it's going to go back to the, you know, the quote unquote olden days where a lot of it's going to look a lot more like mass media. And I don't think that's all good necessarily. I don't, I don't even think that it serves the consumer. You know, a lot of people talk about how they're doing this for, you know, the sake of privacy and things like that. They're really not. I mean, it's, it's, it's largely being lobbied by companies who want to be able to push smaller companies out. Um, it, it, so, I mean, the motives behind it are largely irrelevant. It's happening. Uh, but but what the result is going to be is that copywriting, messaging, the ability to write a message that just taps into the deepest core desire of your market, that's going to win. And that's where marketers need to be focusing and double down. Now, 
we will not hire somebody as a marketer on this team unless they can write copy at any level. Everybody must be able to write copy. And so we have, you know, whether it's writing a, an announcement email or something like that as an aspect of every job interview now, it, it just has to be. Um, and the second, so messaging copywriting is the first thing. Uh, the second one is, is the collection of first party data, right? More and more, we as companies have to have to own the data that we intend to target because while we may not have cookies, the ability to take the data that we have and give that data to, you know, Facebook and Google and say, hey, Facebook, Google, target these people in this way. If that's your data, I don't really see that going away uh, anytime soon. Yeah, knock, knock on wood. But you got to have the data. And so a lot of folks that haven't been collecting this data, I'm talking simple stuff like, you know, maybe you got an email list, but do you know if you're B2B, do you know what company that person is on? Uh, do you know the size of their company? Uh, are you using tools to kind of reverse append what you don't know? Are you giving so much value? You know, when you ask somebody to opt in, whether it's for a webinar or a lead magnet or anything, register for anything, are you giving so much value that they're willing to go through a couple of extra steps and answer a couple of simple questions? Uh, if you're not, you got to up your game on the value in advance because we really need to be able to get that data. Uh, so those are the two things. And that actually connects back to what you're saying about messaging. You got to hook them with something that's valuable and that's the content. So got to be able to write, got to be able to sell that message. I'm actually curious too, um, you talked a lot about messaging where the merchant is or your customer is. To me, that also includes where they are in their buyer's journey, where they are in that full funnel of marketing. What is your advice on getting the right message at the right place at the right time? Yeah, it, it, it's a really great question. Um, in the past, I would have said, um, well, you can leverage, you know, cookie based retargeting to say, OK, if somebody opted in here, but they didn't yet buy, you know that they're kind of at that subscribe stage of the buyer's journey. But if they didn't move on to the next one, then we're going to need to retarget them with some additional content to get them to, to move forward. This is all harder in a cookie world. Right. We don't necessarily have access to all of this. Now, again, it isn't gone yet, but having the ability to collect that data and say, OK, this person on our end, we know because we're running a you know powerful CRM or something like that. This person on our end, they made it to this page. And then you're feeding that data back to Facebook and Google so that you can still retarget based on the stage. That is still such a powerful thing that we have. I mean, you think about from a merchant perspective, right? Somebody somebody came they, they, they purchased some items from your store. Um, they left without taking some other, you know, items that, that they could have. The ability to follow up and say, hey, you forgot this. This is great. That is so incredibly powerful. And, and, and that is what you're talking about. I mean, you're, you are marketing to them at the stage. You're not telling them they should become a customer. You're, you're acknowledging the previous positive action they took, which is you made this purchase and that is awesome. But if you made this other purchase, that would be even more awesomer. Right. Um, and, and so I think the ability to do that kind of retargeting, same thing with email. Oh, my gosh. Email, because if they took an action that required them to fill out a form or, you know, we're sharing that kind of data back and forth where we know that this person went into this thing like that is so incredibly powerful um, as well. So you're right. I mean, it's not just who they are or where they are. It is where are they in that in that journey? And that is the next level. I mean, that's some next level advanced stuff. Maybe we'll do another podcast on that. There you go. <laughs> um, like most things in the digital space, technology is a huge component to success. What are some of the leading tools that businesses can implement to go from keeping up to standing out? Yeah, I'm, I'm slow to give specific names of tools because, you know, some tools that were once good kind of become whatever. Um, but I'm a fan of any tool that decentralizes the, anything that, that did, used to have to be centralized. So um, design, for example, and I'm not disrespecting designers. I believe that kind of the core of a brand uh, should be built by an internal creative team. But once that's created, yeah, dang it, you shouldn't have to be like, well, we need an ad. Let's run that back through the creative team. Marketers don't want that. And the creative people don't want to build all those things. They're like, no, I, I created the concept Figure it out. Go do your 73,000 different Facebook and Instagram ads that you need to split test, right? Um, and so when I think about a tool like Canva, 
right, that, that really decentralizes and democratizes um, the, you know, the, the, the design process. I, uh, like, stuff like that is amazing. We need a Canva for video. Um, hopefully Canva or somebody does that because that is kind of that next, that next wave. And if you know of one, I'm, you know, I'm looking. Um, but, and even, you know, you think about tools like Big Commerce that I remember how hard it used to be to set up a simple web store. I did it. I did it when it was, you know, all static web pages and you want to go and launch multiple products. And so you're duplicating pages over here and, you know, you're like, oh, I need to change my terms of service. And so you got to do that across 73,000 different pages. It's stuff that we take for granted now. Um, but these tools make it easy. So I think anything that democratizes something that was previously centralized, I'm here for that. That's that's my jam. Um, and, and especially design, uh, coding related, so all these different no-code tools that are coming out. Uh, anytime you can implement those, the key is for, for two reasons. One, to make sure that you're starting from a, a solid foundation, but also so that you don't alienate your teams, right? You, you still want to have like, again, creative in particular. You need professionals that are doing that or it's going to go crazy. Uh, have, have those design standards. So you create the prototypes and then you roll them out to each of the individual teams so that you don't have you don't have everything going back through a single bottleneck. I personally use Canva all the time, and I think it is a great, easy tool with amazing templates for pretty much anything you're trying to design. And I might be a little bit partial to big commerce, but I also think it's a great, easy to use tool with amazing templates and the ability to customize almost everything. Yeah, same. Yeah, no. I, and again, really, like I, it, it is amazing that that you can just spin something up quickly and the and the level of customization that you can do after the fact that you can't do with a lot of you know your competitors especially for you know companies that are wanting to to do their own thing i think that that and it's that combination because a lot of the times the tools that decentralize they also put you in a really tight box and so i love the tools that allow for okay anybody can do this but even using this tool we can still make it our own um, so that we're not going across different platforms like, well, the real work is done in this one. Uh, it's like, no, no, no. Give me a tool that can do both the quote unquote real work, the, the customized work, the build from scratch work. And that once that is is done and in place, you know, normal people like me who don't know how to code, who don't know how to do fancy stuff can can duplicate. But based on that solid foundation. Yeah. No, this has been amazing. Ryan, if our listeners want to connect with you after this, where can they find you? Uh, best place for me personally and directly is Twitter. So just twitter.com forward slash Ryan Dice. And that's uh, D-E-I-S-S. Uh, hit me up. Uh, I, I love Twitter. I really do. Uh, probably spend way too much time there. Also, you know, it was it was fun getting to talk about um, entrepreneurship and leadership and some of these other things. You know, I largely play a marketer on TV. You know, digital marketer is what I'm most known for. And uh, But tell a family secret, I don't do a lot of marketing. A lot of the day-to-day -day in the trenches marketing more. I meant what I said. We've hired great marketers. Um, and so I love building and running companies. So recently we started a, a totally new brand that was focused more around that. That's at uh, scalable.co. So if you want to see our new project, you know, you're kind enough to mention digital marketer a number of times, but uh, scalable.co.co uh, is our is our new project that's more for entrepreneurs and founders. So uh, check that out as well. Awesome. It's been wonderful talking to you, Ryan. Thank you for joining us. And for all of those that are listening, stay tuned for more episodes of the Make It Big podcast. Thanks for listening to the Make It Big podcast. Want even more insights and expert advice? Experience our Make It Big conference, now available on demand. You'll get e-commerce tips and strategies from global thought leaders like Mark Cuban, Ann Handley, and Neil Patel, plus big commerce partners like Google, TikTok, and more. Watch today at bigcommerce.com slash make it big.